Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I'm Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangu Ward. Ooh, I'm messing up the order. And Peter Suderman. Hello, everybody. And Catherine, how exciting is it to be sitting in a studio with Nick Gillespie? It is so exciting. Yeah. You guys moved the Spider-Man, though, didn't you? We did. Out of deference to Nick's sensibilities. Or Peter's. This uh, is... Happy Monday, and Nick, you stole my spot. Yeah, I'm coming back Rude. for it next week. Next week. Uh, as you come back from Boston, which I understand is not as wonderfully libertarianly governed, Peter. So I have been told claimed. by Boston. some excellent, excellent and smart uh, letters from listeners. I appreciate yeah. that. And uh, Crispus Attics, right? <laughs> too soon. Yeah. Uh, we're going to delve into the somberness despite that cold opening uh, of today's headlines uh, here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Qualia Life. Life, Life. Friends, have you heard the one about Senolytics? Senolytics is the name we give to a category of ingredients discovered over the past decade or so, which could prove to be a game changer for healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime, if that's indeed possible for Nick Gillespie. Here's how senolytics work. As we age, all of us accumulate senescent cells in our bodies. Senescent cells are the ones that cause symptoms of aging, aches and discomfort, slow workout recovery, sluggish mental and physical energy. These zombie cells are old and worn out, taking up space and nutrients from your healthy cells. Now, though, you can prune these dead cells by taking Qualia Senolytic. Qualia Senolytic is a vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO supplement, and you only need to take it twice a month to remove those zombie cells and keep them from making you feel old. To join the resistance against aging, just go to qualialife.com slash roundtable and get up to 50% off. Then use the code roundtable at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's Q-U-A-L-I-A life.com slash roundtable. Or just go to select GNC locations and look for Qualia Senolytic. By whatever means, do it today. You'll be glad you did. Okay. One year ago today, thousands of Palestinian terrorists burst through or paraglided over the militarized border between the Gaza Strip and southeastern or southwestern Israel, brutally murdering around 1,200 people, including more than 30 Americans, most of them civilians, also taking nearly 200 uh, hostages back into Gaza. It was the highest Jewish death count on a single day since World War II. Uh, and yet another bloody milestone in one of the planet's longest-running conflicts. In the year since then, Israel has pushed a pulverizing war through almost all of Gaza, killing an estimated 43,000 people, although numbers are obviously very hard to come by. Uh, 100 hostages, still their whereabouts still remain unknown. Uh, the Iranian-backed terrorist group Hezbollah in southern Lebanon shows October 7th to immediately open up a northern front, at least in the air, uh, and sending uh, rockets uh, kind of constantly. Israel had to uh, withdraw 100,000 of its citizens. And then over the past month, Israel has basically wiped out all of senior uh, Hezbollah leadership, or in, in less than senior as well, uh, in a series of uh Daring, crazy uh, strikes. Uh, there's even, uh, as we speak on this morning of October 7th, uh, Israel's conducting airstrikes in Beirut in populated areas uh, going after weapons depot. The world, including whoever is running things in the White House, uh, remains on edge trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Iran sent 200 plus ballistic missiles into Israel last week and uh, miraculously only uh, one person uh, died a Gazan from that. We don't know what's happening uh, in the world. And there's a whole bunch of U.S. Navy in the Persian Gulf and around there. Uh, Catherine, let's get reflective about this, uh, maybe more than programmatic. Uh, we've lived through probably too many uh, days that changed everything uh, in our lifetimes, including most uh, notoriously or worsely uh, September 11th, 2001. Uh, how do you think October 7th changed things? I think it made the uh, the thing that so many people were hoping to deny about what was happening in that region undeniable. This was never going to be a conflict that could be resolved um, peacefully, I don't think. And um, that was demonstrated over and over by your various intifadas, your various kind of flares up of violence. Um, I think there was this idea that when it was out of the headlines in the U.S., that maybe things were getting better. Uh, things were not getting better. 
it turned out. And um, now they have gotten almost unbelievably worse. And I, I think that's the place that I am after a year is um, we seem farther than ever from any kind of resolution. And um, and maybe we always were this far. And so all that we've done now is sort of make the underlying hopelessness manifest. Nick, how has this changed the way you look at things or how do you think that it has changed the way uh, the world should look at things uh, one year later? A couple of uh, general thoughts. And one is I actually disagree with Catherine in terms of um, it, not that things are not terrible there right now and whatnot, but I actually think the October 7th attacks, which were obviously done by Hamas, but were pushed and, and sponsored by Iran, it was a, re a reaction to improvements in the kind of geopolitics of the region once the U.S. pulled out. Um, and, you know, the uh, U.S. retreat uh, withdrawal from Iraq and broadly from the area, as much as we have been withdrawn, uh, you know, pretty much in our lifetimes, uh, with the combined with the Abraham Accords, there's actually comedy growing between, you know, Egypt and Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, et cetera. And I think... In the long run, I don't know about the medium run, and that might be all that matters or the short run, but in the long run, this is actually what October 7th has helped do is to show how Iran is the common enemy of the people who are in the Gulf and the Gulf states. It's not religious ultimately. It is more uh, nationalistic and imperial in, in, in a different sense of the word. And I think what you're going to see over time is the fact that uh, you know countries like Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Israel have more in common than they don't. Those countries, the Arab countries, have have allowed uh, have either given actual air support or allowed the Israelis to operate in a way that is unthinkable. You know, even 20, 30, or 40 years ago. So in that sense, I think I am optimistic about the possibilities in the in the region. In the context of the United States, the thing that I was thinking about a lot over the weekend was the immediate response among aspects uh, of the American left that absolutely undeniably celebrated the Hamas slaughter of innocents. Um, and that has had a major effect that I think will be uh, felt for years to come, where it's fractured the left, where liberals went along with progressives and we're kind of like, okay, yeah, we're in for we're in for a penny, we're in for a pound. What you've seen over the past year are people who used who would have been on the left are now pulling back from the most insane aspects of the progressive left, which um, is the part that is celebrating Hamas. Uh, or you know, rallying around Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization who first and foremost terrorizes Lebanese people, uh, you know, and then Israelis, et cetera. So, in that sense, I you know, I think that has been a clarifying moment over the past year. Uh, and then the the other thing, which I think is also cause for uh, optimism, is that the American response to all of this, or the American people. We have learned lessons from uh, our terrible foreign policy for most of the 21st century. Um, you do not hear people clamoring for American boots on the grounds or a you know a, an involvement up to our necks in either Israel or Ukraine. Um, there are people who you know think we should aid these countries, and I you know I, I agree with that to uh, to most uh, extents. But we are no longer acting as if the last 20 years of American failed military interventions and uh, attempts to um, uh, do regime change hadn't been tried and failed. So, it, you know, in a weird way, a year after um, and particularly just a few weeks after these incredible targeted uh, Israeli successes uh, in terms of like, you know, kneecapping both Hamas, but Iran and especially Hezbollah, you know, I, I think there's reasons to be optimistic. Uh, Peter, as the World War III worry wart on this podcast, do you share Nick's optimism? Uh, I think I'm somewhere in between Catherine and Nick, actually. I mean, we just very obviously live in a world that is more dangerous and more volatile internationally in, than it was a year ago or two years ago with the war in, you know, uh, the, in the Middle East and as well as in Russia, right? And in the Middle East, I think, you know, from here, 
I I take Nick's point in some ways. You can kind of see a path to something like stability here in the medium term or the long term where Iran's proxies are defeated. Iran itself is more or less contained um, and mitigated. Hamas is routed. And Israel ends up allied with other Middle Eastern powers like Egypt. Like, I think that's a very plausible outcome here. But I think you can also see a long-term path to instability as the conflict just keeps going. Maybe not at this level, but at a lower level where people never really start to feel safe again. And it never seems like, oh, we have reached some sort of uh, peaceful equilibrium because bitter memories linger and they end up driving policy decisions and decisions about uh, about violence and about war. Um, and sort of to bring this back home, you know, the way I think about that is, it, we live in this more dangerous world now. We live in this, or at least a more volatile world. And it would be very nice if the United States had a functioning presidency. Because right now, the, I mean, the thing that you pointed out, sort of, you know, in, at least or pointed to at the, in, in the beginning here, Matt, was it's not at all clear who is making decisions in the White House, right? President Biden just seems so clearly out to lunch, disconnected from whatever his own administration is doing. He doesn't really seem to be a part of it. And maybe maybe I think there's some libertarians who might argue, well, that's a good thing because is it, it is allowing regional actors to make their own decisions without U.S. interference, without the U.S. trying to kind of play director here. And I think maybe there is something that is good to that, uh, good about that, except that the United States has thousands of troops in, in the area. The United States is is not just pulling out, is not just sort of saying, well, we you know, they're, we're not making a decision to to not be part of this. It's just that Joe Biden is himself not part of this. And maybe, maybe that's better in some ways. Um, you know, here in the in the short term. But if there is a real crisis, if there is a moment where you need someone to be in charge and to make a decision, the whole point of the presidency in the American constitutional system is that you don't have things run by a committee in those crisis moments. And right now, things are being run by a committee of, uh, you know, essentially of, of political appointees and uh, top advisors rather than by the president himself. And I think that that is that is a dangerous and scary world to live in as an American. I think one thing that has been laid bare by this, whether or not this is percolated down to the major political parties and their candidates for president, uh, is that it shows the limits, illustrates the limits of America's never-ending uh, major player character syndrome. Uh, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, wrote a piece uh, that went to press five days before the uh, October 7th massacre. I wrote it for Foreign Affairs, a uh, 7,000 word essay uh, about all of the successes of the Biden of foreign policy team. And he wrote things such as, quote, although the Middle East remains beset with perennial challenges, the region is quieter than it has been for decades. Uh, and he also uh, bragged that we have de-escalated crises in Gaza. Whoops. Um, that is not obviously what has happened. And we have this tendency in our dumb politics to always personalize everything. Um, Trump in Donald Trump, uh, when he's running for president, he will constantly say that, uh, you know, this bad thing wouldn't have happened under me. Um, this uh, could be true. We don't know. It's hard to hard to say. Uh, but we also know that that lends to his kind of great man theory of uh, international relations which is not great because uh, that uh, invests a lot of unhealthy power into the presidency and uh, continues the illusion of omnipotence that just doesn't exist anymore. So we should be, I think, transitioning to a world where uh, America can't dictate outcomes. And all we have seen is this. At some point, uh, people are going to wake up to the uh, realization that Benjamin Netanyahu, you know, he keeps the U.S. under advisement, uh, but at this stage right now, it's pretty unclear. There's even reporting from today or yesterday over the weekend uh, that the administration is thinking about like cash rewards to Israel for not hitting Iran too hard in retaliation. And if that is at all true, um, that kind of illustrates the rudderlessness of American foreign policy on this stuff. Like, uh, the Are Biden they going to redirect money from FEMA? Yeah, I mean, it's not a great, not a great look. As long when as people... it's not going to Haitians, it's good. 
uh, are are dying everywhere uh, in this country. Uh, and also, it's just like uh, it it shows how much uh, U.S. foreign policy under Biden has been like, just please don't escalate too hard. Um, and then otherwise, like uh, not really having an idea about which uh, direction things should going on. So we should um, translate that into let's stop pretending that we are omnipotent. Um, I fear that we're not exactly uh, there anytime soon. Uh, Catherine, uh, maybe a quick semi follow up to that concept. You alluded at the beginning to like maybe this stuff was always intractable and we had been sustaining these fictions as of October 6th, um, that X, Y, and Z could be achieved through, uh, peaceful means. Um, is that a way of saying we should remove the phrase two state solution from the U S diplomatic, uh, like, uh, uh, whatever the source. <laughs> uh, sure. this, the, there's the, a word the there. Source. I don't know yeah. what the word is. Playbook. Playbook. From it's the playbook? urban dictionary as used the by the US blob. diplomatic urban dictionary. Um, so I, I think not quite that far. I would say when Joe Biden says two state solution, all I can hear is, yeah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I, I think that that is what that phrase means right now. I do think it's entirely possible that the way this ends is, in fact, s two states of some kind in that disputed territory. But I don't I don't think the U.S. has shown any ability to bring that about after decades of just saying that phrase reflexively every time somebody asks. And I think that the. Yeah, like my pessimism in my first answer comes from the fact that um, this was never a quiet time in the Middle East. This was never on the verge of being resolved. This was never, I mean, this is this stupid Jake Sullivan essay, like, oh, congrats, like we did it. Good good work, American foreign policy uh, actors. Things are, things are looking fine in that region. We have no idea. We have no idea what's going on. And um, the sooner we accept that, the better, but I, I don't, maybe there will be two states, but I don't think it's a solution we can give to them. Nick, you're a big the fan of- two states are going to be confusion and frustration. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you're a big fan of the Abraham Accords, uh, negotiated under Trump. Uh, Barack Ravid's book about that is called Trump's Peace, and he's no fan of Trump. Uh, question for you, though. The usual role for the U.S. in- being around the Abraham Accords, and Trump was key to that, or Jared Kushner as well. Is to sell Bibles that is include both the Old Testament and the New Testament, as well as America's founding documents, Matt, uh, for just $60 sell... it, with a leatherette covering. Lee Greenwood baldness uh, removal <laughs> yeah. uh, A bargain, considering yeah. that every single one of those documents is available for free. Uh, yeah, no, uh, but it's little... not the same when they're all in one place. With you a raised didn't. binding and gilt-edged page. Who doesn't want to have those in public schools in Oklahoma? One of the holdups to Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, coming to an, an overt peaceful resolution is that Saudi Arabia wants to have like these gold-plated security guarantees from the United States. Uh, they want to be a major non-NATO ally. Uh, should we just kind of get out of that business and say, hey, look, you're going to live there no matter what. We're not. Um, figure it out yourselves uh, and maybe them realizing that there is no like extra sweetener from the U.S. will have them face the reality that they need to cohabitate with Israel sooner. Yeah, I, I you know, yeah, uh, in short in, in the shortest form, form possible. Yes. Um, and I think the way that you sweeten it is not with arms deals and things like that or even security uh, or defense guarantees as much as trade. Saudi Arabia is trying to become more like the UAE, um, which doesn't have, you know, the history of, uh, you know, chopping up people who may or may not have been journalists uh, in Turkish embassies and things like that. Um, so I, I think there's a way to do that. Um, you know, to go to your point, Matt, we act as if, uh, you know, the U.S. acts as if we are the major player in all of this. But it's clear we're not. You know, Israel did not tell the U.S. that it was going into Lebanon the way that it did until they had started doing it. Because, you know, Israel is not acting as if they have to clear anything with the United States. Um, you know, and the U United States should start, you know, th we need to get that message. And I think recognize that we're going to do better by pulling out more than trying to, uh, you know, make sure that we are at the table and that everything is given, uh, you know, that the U.S. somehow 
makes things happen. That's just it's it hasn't been the case. It's not going to be the case. The you know a, a Middle East peace is going to come from within the countries in the Middle East, probably you know. Uh, uh, coalescing around a shared uh, fear uh, and a righteous fear of Iran, um, you know, as and 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 a country like Syria, which acts in concert with Iran all the time. The the sooner we get that, uh, you know, in our heads, I think the better it'll be for everybody. All right, we uh, mentioned earlier, referenced earlier, Hurricane Helene. Uh, believe it or not, there's another deadly uh, hurricane at this moment barreling towards Tampa. Uh, it's already a Category 4 Hurricane Milton. Um, uh, presumably that's not Milton Friedman. That's uh, Milton Berle uh, or John Milton. I don't know. Nick, come up with a Milton for us. Uh, it's uh, Milt or, Campbell. Uh, it's already the, uh, at uh, category, category 4. Um, it's supposed to come in Wednesday, even as parts of Florida and Georgia, Tennessee, and especially North Carolina continue to try to dig out of Hurricane Helene, uh, which is the worst we've seen in this country since Katrina with more than 200 deaths. Uh, Peter, this is your uh, part of the world. Uh, can you, are you able to even, uh, give us a snapshot both of like the devastation of Helene and uh, and also amid all the fog of politics uh, uh, about the government response, uh, particularly on the federal level? So just in terms of the devastation, it's a bad scene and there's no... There's no sugarcoating it. There's no saying, well, you know, it's it's not as bad as it sort of sounds like. It's a bad scene. And I guess we don't know exactly how bad. And this is part of the problem is that in North Carolina in particular, you have a lot of low lying floodland areas that have just that have just been devastated by flooding that where the the waters rose up to the level of you know the second or third floor of a house where cars and 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 vehicles and uh, cars and buildings and just everything has been taken out and it, there are scenes in uh, you know like the river arts district uh, where i walked around just last year um that place just seems to be kind of gone and gone in a way where you sort of wonder, will it ever come back at all in the form that it was in? And that was a district that was sort of, uh, you know, artsy bars and also artists' workshops, things like that, right? It was just kind of interesting, you know, sort of hipstery, uh, innovative, like low cost, like people just doing interesting stuff down there. Uh, and and that whole area seems to be just, you know, completely devastated. And then around the, uh, around the Asheville area uh, in North Carolina, you just have a whole lot of... Um, that are mountain, mountainous areas where the roads have been blocked off um, or the roads, and I, should, I shouldn't say blocked off because in many cases, it's not just that they are closed by the authorities, it's that the roads kind of don't exist anymore or they don't exist in any kind of functional state. And that means that it's very, very difficult to get in and perform rescue operations or to get aid to people. Uh, and so what we have seen is this kind of haphazard and, you know, um, and distributed effort uh, by both federal and local authorities as well as private operations to try to get aid. And the news that is coming out of that is just maddening because I cannot, I mean, like I, I'm, a lot of it is coming from Facebook posts of people who you don't know sort of thing, or, you know, oh, but a friend says, I know somebody who knows this guy. So it seems like, well, is this person actually providing an accurate picture? You don't know. These are not people who have any kind of journalistic reputation. It doesn't seem like they're necessarily lying on purpose. Although and we know that people post things on Facebook uh, for reasons that we don't always understand or just that are, you know, inaccurate. Um, because they have a they misperceive what's going on, and so it's very very difficult to get a kind of holistic sense, uh, 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 a big picture of what is actually going on. But it's a bad scene. Um, there are a bunch of different disparate rescue efforts. There are reports that the government is blocking at least some of the private efforts, um, or making it more difficult, I should say, for those folks to get in. At the same time, the information that I'm hearing again through stuff that is that is not entirely verified is that, look, in some cases, they're blocking people from getting in just because uh, the logistics to get into some of these mountain regions where the roads are kind of non-functional, the logistics are, are really bad. And so they're saying, oh, you can't take a gigantic truck up this mountain because that gigantic truck isn't going to work, right? Like you're going to have to offload all the stuff and like put it on smaller smaller vehicles or, or things like that. And so again, it's just, it's very, very difficult to tell what's going on. It's very difficult to tell uh, whether, or not, you know, what the relationship is right now between local, federal, and private aid uh, authorities and efforts is, and, and whether or not they're really working well together, or whether or not they're in great tension here. Um, but it's a mess. And it's, um, 
And it's even more of a mess because it, or you know, part of the mess is we don't know how to solve this problem because we don't know the exact scale and particulars of the problem just because like getting in and seeing getting information out of the out of the zones that have been destroyed is is so difficult. Catherine, what are some uh, perhaps perennial uh, reason slash libertarian lessons about public policy and uh, disaster response or preparedness even, uh, and are any of those lessons not annoying? Um, I, I regret to inform you that all libertarian lessons are annoying, and so here we are. Uh, this is just our bed, and we made it. Um, so there, there's a couple things that are going on. One is, you know, it unfortunately, it's become a kind of extremely partisan-coded uh, critique at the moment to say that FEMA kind of sucks. Um, this is it's it's bouncing around in weird ways in the presidential election. Um, and uh, that should not distract us from the fact that FEMA kind of sucks. FEMA is really very bad. And um, Hurricane Katrina was a, an incredible demonstration of that. But so have many disasters since been an incredible demonstration of that. Um, it is not a well-run bureaucracy. It is um, inefficient in its absolute best form and um, obstructionist in its worst. Uh, the sort of discourse around money going to immigrants versus money going to uh, Americans who are affected by um, by Helene has been just incredibly stupid. And we can talk about that real quick if we want to. But um, just first and foremost, like, don't trust the feds to save you when you need saving is now and always the lesson. Uh, talk about that then. Haitians. Yeah. OK, so here's what's going on. We have Donald Trump, as usual, helpfully just like throwing um, sort of a, a smattering of untrue things into the discourse. In this case, uh, the, the um, allegation is that money that was allocated for disaster relief has gone instead to uh, programs that house um, immigrants. Now, first of all, we're just to get the scale. Um, the program that uh, gives block grants to state and local governments to house immigrants, uh, that's a $650 million program. It's separately appropriated. That money exists in a box for that purpose. That's compared with $35 billion for disaster relief. So even if that money was being borrowed from the disaster relief fund, it still would not be a substantial portion of it. However, it's not. It's a totally separate fund. Uh, the folks at FEMA have said they have plenty of money to handle Hurricane Helene. They're a little worried if Milton hits right on its tail that they might need more money. Of course, that's what people from FEMA say when they go in front of Congress. The only thing they're ever going to say is we need more money. So, you know, I think we should take that with a grain of salt. And if they do need more money, we have an emergency appropriations process for that. Again, totally unrelated to housing migrants. Now, somebody did raid the disaster fund to uh, deal with our immigration issues. That was Donald Trump during his presidency, who took money um, illegally out of the, not quite illegally. Um, improperly. Improperly. It was not illegal. He is allowed to do it. He gave notice um, improperly out of a uh, uh, yeah, un unrelated monies and put them into uh, border enforcement. So as usual, accusations against Democrats are very much like I'm rubber and you're glue type situation. Nick. Also of note, that $650 million fund for immigration, uh, for immigrants that Catherine mentioned, that money is appropriated by Congress. It was Congress that decided that that money would be spent that way, not FEMA, not the executive branch. And as a result, the executive branch does not have the capability, does not is not allowed to spend it some other way. And so if you are mad that that money is being spent that way, blame Congress. Nick, uh, so... FEMA is annoying and uh, Donald Trump is annoying. Um, uh, just to keep the triple hater vibe going <laughs> on uh, forever. Am I Why wrong? only three? Yeah, yeah, that's you can, true. You can have yeah. as many hates as okay, you want, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, am I wrong at being annoyed at uh, the media, uh, including in the vice presidential debate, which we'll talk about later, um, Pivoting immediately in the first like sentence of, oh, Hurricane Helene, a lot of people suffering policy. Yeah. Okay. You have my attention. Climate change. 
you know, do you believe in climate change or not? And uh, in, in a lot of the media reports are like that. Is that just me being like uh, skin deep, annoyed and myopic and that maybe that's what we should be talking about? Or am I totally right about everything? Yeah, I, I think you I hate to admit that you're probably totally right about everything, Matt. Um, and one of the other things to think about with the media this time around is they're definitely, I think, softballing uh, the the FEMA response, uh, the the badness of it, and whether or not it reflects poorly on the current administration. Katrina, you know, FEMA did not act well. The federal government did not act well uh, during Katrina, and it reflected very poorly on George W. Bush, as it should have. Uh, you know, the state and local governments also acted pretty poorly in those cases, uh, in those particular cases as well. But this time, it just doesn't seem to be percolating up to you know the person who's been running FEMA. Uh, you know, for the past, uh, or, you know, uh, Biden and his administration. I think, you know, there were uh, on the 10 year anniversary of Katrina, there were a bunch of reports that came out, all of which said that FEMA had gotten a little bit better, it had gotten a lot more money, and it had gotten a ton more administration, uh, administrators and things like that, but it hadn't really confronted how it does stuff. One of the lingering questions here, and it's really hard to know, uh, you know, as I think other people were saying, a, b a bunch of the information that comes out of this is all bullshit where it's like, oh, well, I don't know, but my cousin told my brother who had a friend who, where this happened, you know, and, and you know, it, it, it's just unreliable. But consistently in natural disasters, um, groups, uh, both nonprofit as well as state as well as private or, you know, uh, government and private groups that are closer to the situation have better information and they tend to act better. Um, and I was going through a, um, a one of those 10 year uh, kind of look backs at Katrina by Chris Edwards of the Cato Institute. And he had written a pretty extensive report about how when you looked at what worked in Katrina, uh, it was almost always uh, groups of people who were closer to the event, had the best information and also the best ways of dealing with stuff. And that is something that's worth keeping in mind here, which is that when you expect a distant, you know, a distant overlord to protect you and to defend you and to help you out, it's not going to end well. The other thing that's worth thinking about, especially if the next hurricane is Milton, you know, is named after Milton Friedman, there's a lot of, you know, on the edges, we need to start thinking about how do you uh, stop subsidizing people to live in coasts that get hurricanes all the time or, or extreme weather events, but also in areas, as Peter was talking about, uh, you know, there it, it has taken forever and we're not even there yet uh, in the Mississippi River to stop subsidizing people living in floodplains and then rebuilding after disasters happen and things like that. This is the type of stuff that almost never happens. But to actually take seriously the signals that markets deliver about where is a good place to live versus where is not, uh, that would be extremely helpful. Matt, I know you have sat through a lifetime of stories about uh, you know uh, rainstorms and mudslides uh, and wildfires in Southern California. Uh, where, you know, you only would hear from Red Buttons or Dick Clark every five years when their house in the middle of nowhere, which should never have been built, but gets built and rebuilt and subsidized by tax dollars, um, you know, they're, they're suddenly trapped and we need to, you know, have uh, convicts parachute in and save Red Buttons or something like that. And I realize Peter and Catherine have no idea who we're talking about. Matt, you may not even remember Suzanne buttons, Summers but, is, um, the, uh, is the go-to example, yeah. I think. Uh, I do but it's Red it's just like you know we we it, this isn't about climate change it is about policies that have been in place for the past hundred years that ultimately end up subsidizing really bad decisions on the part of many people. I would invite anyone who's uh, uh, thinking about making a politics about this or. Uh, sharing uh, very kind of uh, uh, partisan edged information about this particular hurricane response uh, to pause and go and look at uh, Hurricane Katrina, maybe even revisit one's own comments at the time and note that maybe all teams have or all parties have switched teams. Um, you know, uh, like Kanye West is probably going to say uh, that uh, Joe Biden hates white people or something. Uh, and in this one, like uh, the the approach towards FEMA. But what will Mike Myers say? 
That is <laughs> that is the eternal question. Yeah, what kind of face curdling will he have to accept? Yeah, uh, in the, he had in a the, Tim. He prefigured Tim Walls as Kanye oh West was God. denouncing George Bush for not caring about black people. Mike Myers was just kind of sprouting a new face. Yes, um, which all of which is to say, um, people who are on the ground, um, as Nick alluded to, are not only doing better, but they're being less political. And maybe there's a lesson for all of us who aren't there. All right, we're going to get to our listener question of the week here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor over at the University of Chicago. Hello, Milton Friedman. Uh, Friends, in an election year, it is too easy to get lost in the fog of news and opinion. Understanding the real-life impact of political events can be a challenge in these even-numbered years. So have we got a podcast for you. It is called Not Another Politics podcast. Uh, Brought to you by the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, Not Another Politics podcast provides clear research-driven perspectives on the biggest issues of the day. Get the insights you need to truly understand the political landscape. No spin, just facts. Subscribe today at harris.uchicago.edu slash N-A-P-P. That's harris.uchicago.edu slash N-A-P-P. Or just look for Not Another Politics Podcast wherever you acquire your podcasts. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, uh, please email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Joel. Hello, he says. I am a non-party classic slash historic liberal. I like historic liberal. And I enjoy your podcast. I also lived in Kiev, Ukraine from 2012 to 2014. I am generally anti-interventionist. Why is it that when I hear the Russian war against Ukraine discussed by libertarians and other anti-interventionists, I've never heard mention of the Budapest Memorandum, documents signed in the early 1990s between Ukraine and the U.S., Britain, France, and Russia, where the signatory nations pledged to defend Ukraine's territorial sovereignty in exchange for Ukraine giving up their significant nuclear weapons from the Soviet arsenal in Ukraine's territory. My understanding is that the Budapest memos didn't specify with any precision the responsibilities of the signatory nation in the case of aggression against Ukraine. But wouldn't that history at least suggest a moral case for strong U.S. involvement? Maybe it shouldn't be tax dollar funded. Maybe our political leaders should remind us of our historical commitment and call for private actors to support Ukraine. I'm not a diplomat or political scientist, so I don't know what should be done. However, I would love for this historical aspect of our involvement to get some airtime in our cultural debates about what our duties ought to be towards Ukraine. Joel, thank you for that. I will uh, take first answer to this. We've almost certainly mentioned it on this podcast, and I know I've written about it, as has uh, J.D. Trucilli on multiple uh, occasions. And you are right to point out to this important, uh, at the time, groundbreaking 1994 piece of diplomacy and its relevance to Russia's uh, initial invasion of a uh, takeover of Crimea in 2014, which is the big thing that that violated that. Um, the way uh, to think about the Budapest Memorandum, which is not a treaty, right? Uh, the U.S. decided, uh, Bill Clinton administration um, uh, judged, and I think accurately, that the U.S. Senate would not be in a mood to ratify a treaty and to create this enforcement teeth in it. The main signatories were the U.S., Britain, and Russia, uh, in addition to Ukraine. And then uh, France and China were kind of uh, did lesser uh, documents. And it was for Ukraine as well as uh, Belarus and I believe Kazakhstan to do similar kind of things. And uh, Russia and everybody else was supposed to respect the territorial sovereignty and to not invade these countries that signed it. And um, the reason why this was held up, uh, uh, the twofold reason as a model of diplomacy, was that it had nothing to do with expanding NATO. Like this is a George Kennan tastic, the guy who helped create originally the kind of uh, coalition uh, of the Cold War in the late 1940s, but then became a huge critic of the expansion of NATO in the 90s. Um, he loved the Budapest Memorandum, and understandably so, because it was a way to create some uh, amount of security guarantees, independence, latitude, while also reducing the threat of nuclear war. Sounds like a win-win. Uh, and now we see how it is not. Um, and it is, if anything, become a lesson in why any country should never give up its nuclear arsenal, uh, whether you are Libya or Ukraine, um, that people will not necessarily respect that. Russia's theory of the case is that as soon as there was the Maidan revolution in Ukraine, then they kind of stopped being a relevant signatory to it. And can we please change the subject as fast as we can kind of thing. The uh, The memorandum also 
kind of devolved and said the UN Security Council will be the uh, main tool of enforcement, which now kind of reads like a laugh line, but it was 1994. And keep in mind, the Security Council was very much involved in the Gulf War, a coalition of nations that came together under US leadership and Russia's blessing too, I might add, or Soviet Union's blessing, um, to thwart the territorial incursion into Kuwait by uh, Iraq. So like it seemed more plausible then, it doesn't seem plausible now. And it's sort of a sign post that, um, you know, a security guarantee without an actual security guarantee is no guarantee of security. Um, and, uh, and and that's the end of that uh, memo. Uh, if anyone has anything else to add, uh, please do. Uh, if not, I can move along. I actually really like the uh, just the passing suggestion that we could perhaps rely on private actors here. Um, just want to just want to give a shout out to uh, the long wished for and utterly unrealized like French Foreign Legion slash Blackwater approach to uh, to American involvement in the world, which continues to appeal to me and exactly no one else. <laughs> uh, you know, the U.S. though has given over sixty billion dollars in military assistance to Ukraine since uh, Russia invaded. So it's not like we've been absent. I'm actually nervous about a lot of that because we don't have an actual security agreement with Ukraine. And, um, you know, uh, we know that a lot of that money will have never made it anywhere close to, uh, you know, the battlefield or anything like that. For me, uh, one of the things uh, reading that letter, it reminded me if the American left's response to the invasion or, you know, the uh, Hamas terrorists was, you know, just horrifying and awful and morally uh, bankrupt. Many in the libertarian world, the way that they very quickly morph from being like, hey, you know what? America shouldn't be involved to this to Ukraine is run by a Jewish Nazi president. Um, and, you know, we welcome Putin's defense of Western civilization and that kind of thing. That left me like really on my heels. I was I was stunned to see the vociferousness with which a lot of people who call themselves libertarian or libertarian adjacent seem to, you know, immediately believe the idea that this was a defensive war on the part of Putin uh, or that somehow Russia has a moral high ground here, which is not to minimize any U.S. chicanery and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, there is a lot of moral confusion in international politics. And I think that's partly, you know, that is one of the great legacies of the Bush administration, along with being, you know, the worst FEMA, you know, administration in history. We have not, you know, since the, since the Cold War ended, we have not generated a useful, pragmatic and peace enhancing uh, inter foreign policy. And it's really, you know, the clock is ticking on that. We can always start that conversation somehow or that move to do something like that. But we continue to just not really rise to that uh, task. Um, I would just add that uh, for those vast majority of people listening to this podcast who uh, were opposed, are opposed to NATO expansion, even from the beginning after the end of the Cold War, two points. One is that Russia was uh, intervening militarily uh, in Abkhazia uh, and Georgia in Moldova, Transnistria in 1992 and 1993. So predating even the Budapest Memorandum to all of that. And two, one would need, I think, to come up with a theory of the case in the absence of NATO expansion. Um, what do smaller countries that live in between superpowers that have historically trod on them, what are they supposed to do? Um, and not everyone has every answer to the world, but it's something to think about from their point of view and why they might be seeking uh, guarantees of whatever stripe, regardless of what one thinks, whether uh, the U.S. should be involved. Uh, all right, let's get to um, a uh, the vice presidential debate last week. There was one, uh, believe it or not. It was unexpectedly um, cordial, almost like genial at times with J.D. Vance and Tim Walls discussing actual policies on occasion. And it was also for uh, many of us just unbearably statist. So let's go around the table and each of us come up with one aspect of how there was some kind of bipartisan anti-libertarian awfulness in this debate. Peter, why don't you start? 
So one of the good developments in policy over the past five or 10 years on both the left and right um, has been the YIMBY movement, which stands for Yes in My Backyard. And this is a sort of, this is the starting place for the abundance agenda, which is um, which is an idea that in fact, what we need to do is remove uh, regulatory barriers and other types of constraints to, to building in particular, but also for energy, for all of these types of policies, right? It, and so you've seen on, on, because this movement started on what I would say is the center left in particular with younger urban professionals, but also because it is deregulatory. You've seen this kind of interesting cross-partisan uh, um, adoption of uh, kind of yimbyish abundance agenda ideas, even if in many cases, imperfectly. And so, of course, this surrounds, uh, like the, the big thing that this surrounds is housing, right? That's the, that's, that's the focus of this movement because, in fact, there's a giant housing shortage in the United States, and housing is very expensive, especially in um, in, in urban areas that are great uh, economic centers, San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., places like that. Housing is very expensive, but also out in the heartland in places like Ohio and places like Minnesota, uh, housing has become much more expensive as well. And so this came up at the debate, and you had this great agreement between J.D. Vance and Tim Walls that housing, we need more of it, and it should be, it's and it's important, but it shouldn't be a commodity. Now, I know Catherine really hates dictionary definitions in uh, in, in posts, especially as leads, but just kind of anywhere in the in reason.com writing. But Christian Britschke noticed this and wrote about it, and he looked up the definition of commodity in the dictionary. And it turns out, you know what it is? It's something that you buy and you sell. Hmm. And what Tim Walls and J.D. Vance both agreed was maybe housing shouldn't be something that you buy and you sell because it's special, because it's meaningful. And of course, yes, of course, everybody is like their home is is very important to them, except for Catherine, who just like rents places for six months and then, and then moves out like every it's I have no idea how she manages to do this. It's because she's a heartless robot. But for the rest of us, we, we do. We really care about our houses. And and but there's this idea that because housing is special somehow, because there's some sort of emotional attachment to it, and it's, it's essential to like having anything like a, a normal life, that we should treat it differently, that we should treat it as something like a non-market good. And so what you had was this joint agreement between Vance and Walls that housing should not be a commodity. And what that in many ways cashed out to was a sort of like gesture at yimbyism, at yes in my backyard, except if you're an immigrant, or you're a big corporation. We definitely don't want immigration, and we definitely don't want big corporations uh, uh, owning a bunch of houses, when in fact, it turns out that immigrants, uh, in part because of the labor supply issues and big corporate ownership, tend to bring down the cost of housing. It's just a terrible agreement here on, uh, from both of them, where you see this kind of Midwestern statism. They're, they're just like, oh, you know, housing is so important that we can't treat it like a normal good. And when you don't treat it like a normal market good, then what happens? Happens is you have a lot less of it, and it's a lot more expensive. Uh, well done, uh, <clears throat> Nick uh, Gillespie. What was a, uh, a bipartisan statism that uh, made your milk curdle? Uh, neither of them were willing to uh, address or even pretend that they were going to cut spending on anything. Uh, usually, you could get um, you know even the vice presidential candidates in a presidential debate. Or a campaign say, hey, you know what, we're going to cut this or that. Um, and you just didn't see that. When they were asked questions about debt and deficits, they immediately went to um, talking about things that were completely unrelated or talking about how uh, you know taxing more people will help shrink deficits maybe, but it's not going to address the top line or we're going to grow our way out of this. And there is just simply no way to do any of that. And so we have been on a bender, you know, a spending bender for decades now. It really kicked into high gear. I realize, uh, you know, I'm talking a lot about George W. Bush um, because I just invest. I bought several hundred thousand dollars worth of his paintings. So I, <laughs> I want to bring him back into the public conversation. But, um, you know, we, we have like this whole century, it's just been spend, baby, spend. And that is not a good way forward. Milton Friedman, uh, also a popular topic today, you know, talked about how the full extent of the government in your life is really the spending that the government does, because eventually it's got to, you know, it, it's got to pay that tune. And, um, you know, we're just, you know, what, what happened, even Mitt Romney, famously would say, I'm going to cut government spending, but then he wouldn't 
identify anything he was actually going to cut. But now we don't even pretend that we're going to cut spending. And to me, that was a uh, kind of tandem thing where these guys were holding hands in all the wrong ways. This is actually a great exchange that I want to re- read from because it was so blatant and like, nope, not going to answer that question. Uh, so the one to Tim Walls is, the Wharton School says your proposals will increase the nation's deficit by $1.2 trillion. How would you pay for that without ballooning the de- deficit? This is the verbatim answer. Yeah, thank you. And Kamala Harris and I do believe in the middle class because that's where we come from. <laughs> we both grew up in that. We understand. And then blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then uh, he the, did everything but talk about his DUI. It's like, hey, can we talk about my DUI, please? I'm just a knucklehead. Who doesn't go 92 and yeah. a 45 uh, drunk and then lie about it? Uh, and then uh, d- same moderator to J.D. Vance. The Wharton School's done an analysis. The Trump plan, it says it would increase the nation's deficit by $5.8 trillion. Uh, how do you pay for all that without ballooning the deficit? Well, first of all, you're going to hear a lot from Tim Walls this evening, uh, and you just heard it in the answer. A lot of what Kamala Harris proposes to do, and some of it, I'll be honest with you, even sounds pretty. It just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nope, don't even, not even the little tiny little hint uh, in yeah. that direction. It was awful. Uh, Catherine, what did you hear that was uh, super statusy? So I, I want to take a kind of half and half answer, which is uh, absolutely a bipartisan convergence that I really didn't expect. Maybe I just haven't been paying enough attention to this this policy area. Um, both of them were are now like yes and energy. Um, they use the same rhetoric. So uh, this is to say that um, we had the Democratic vice presidential candidate boasting about incredibly high oil and gas production during uh, the Biden administration. This is not something you would necessarily have heard before. Um, you would have heard boasting about solar panels or, um, you know, clean energy or this kind of thing. But he was just like, yeah, man, we are just like really getting those dead dinosaurs out of the ground and into your cars. You're welcome. And it was like, what's happening? Um, but both of them ended up saying the same thing, which was like, uh, we need to produce energy here at home. It should be all forms. We should be doing um, green energy, we should be doing oil and gas. Um, Walls has both been kind of a big climate change guy and um, has voted in favor of pipelines, um, in, in favor of, um, you know, extracting from um, U.S. waters. Like he is he is not uh, easy to pigeonhole. Um, I think the issue here, though, is that they agree it's OK, let's produce all types of energy here at home. But they really mean their kind, and they're going to subsidize that kind. And so in that sense, it is sadist all around. You know, the Democrats are still going to just like dump as much money as they can into solar and wind and whatever else. The Republicans are still just delighted to subsidize oil companies as much as they possibly can. And um, I didn't hear one single person being like, hey, maybe we could just let Americans buy their energy from the cheapest source in a free market. Absolutely not. Meanwhile, Grandpa Joe is out here just casually wrecking the energy markets a couple days ago by being like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Israel might bomb the Iranian oil production. If that happens, we'll talk about it. And it was just like the markets lost their minds because he has no idea what's going on, I guess. Uh, My example is uh, more of the way they both uh, vigorously nodded and said, "Uh uh-huh, and then elaborated on a typically statist moderator question, which began with, there's a child care crisis in this country. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm, yeah, uh, yeah, here's here's what we're going to do about the child care. This is what the federal government should do about the child care crisis in this country. And I just realized I'm literally just- the federal department of your mom. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that hits different with J.D. Vance, too. Um, uh, all right, let's go to... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming in the cultural arena. Nick, why don't you lead us off? So I am, uh, uh, I be- read uh, John B. Judas's and Rui Teixeira's Where Have All the Democrats Gone, which is a scathing attack on the current Democratic Party by uh, guys who in the early 21st century wrote a book about the coming Democratic supermajority. Um, And um, they uh, look at how uh, the Democrats by their lights have completely abandoned the working class, which is roughly analogous to uh, people who don't have college degrees and how that has 
um, really hurt the ability of the Democratic Party to uh, get and maintain governing majorities. I am going to be talking with Rui Teixeira, who's now at AEI of all places, uh, with and Patrick Ruffini, who's a Republican pollster at Echelon Insights, who wrote a book uh, called Party of the People, which is about how the Republican Party has kind of lost college-educated people and is moving into more and more uh, concert with uh, non-college-educated people of all uh, races and ethnicities. So it's an interesting convergence um, to uh, you know look at the uh, Texera book uh, and Judas book. Um, you know we're in a moment where both parties are declining in terms of their ability to to deliver votes on a regular basis and to maintain governing majorities. And there seems to be, you know, uh, uh, recognition that uh, recognition about that shift, uh, which is that the Republicans are becoming more attuned to populist appeals to working class or non-college ed- educated Americans. And, um, you know, I'm extremely it's, – it's, it's a great read and uh, their policy prescriptions, Judas and Teixeira, are terrible because they tend to come from a kind of uh, uh, you know, mid – late 20th century Democratic Party of like what we really need is to build everything around big labor. Um, but the analysis of how the Democratic Party has shifted away from the consensus that brought it to a lot of – you know, governing majorities for long periods of time after World War II is really fascinating and strikes me as mostly on point. And, you know, it'll be fascinating to see how all this plays out in this current election. Um, Peter, what did you uh, consume? I watched Joker, Fale Adieu, the second <laughs> one. Did I say that wrong? Is that, sure I, did. That, was, that was my best Pepe Le Pew accents. <laughs> Actually, I could probably do a better one, but we'll we'll save that for another episode. <laughs> um no, I, so I want it's the sequel to Joker and it's a musical and it's miserable. And it's not just miserable because it's a musical, although the musical aspect of it does help with the misery because the songs are just listless and awful and Joaquin Phoenix cannot sing to like to save his life. And in fact, he kind of has to sing to save his life because what this movie is is somehow it's a courtroom drama also. In addition to a musical, this is a it's a Joker movie that has absolutely nothing that you would expect or want from a Joker movie, even less than the first one, which was a little bit of a sort of a, a, a turn, but was fundamentally a sort of a, a twisted origin story for the the character. I didn't love it, um, but at least I thought there was some kind of there was some verve there. There was something really it was kind of trying to prod people in a particular direction. It was nicely crafted. There were some really great images, and uh, especially the way the images and the music sort of uh, work together in the first one. Um, so it wasn't a great movie but there was at least something there. And this movie is just an effort to kick the viewers in the head and punch them in the face and say, you idiots, you didn't understand the first one. So let's go over it again. And this is, it's fundamentally, it is a two and a half hour recap of the first film. So he talks with his lawyer about the stuff he did in his first, uh, in the first film. And then he talks with a journalist about the stuff he did in the first film. And then he goes to court in the middle of the movie and he goes over again, all the things that he did in the first film. And it just reminds you, oh, over and over again that you know what the joker is bad and you people who thought this was cool who enjoyed this oh you're awful you idiots you fans i hate you this is a movie that actively hates everyone who enjoyed the first film that made a billion dollars and got all of the principal players gigantic paydays and the opportunity to make this movie i hated it so much it is maybe not the worst thing i've seen this year Because I have seen Madam Web, which might be the actual worst movie I've ever seen in a movie theater. But it is it is the most off putting movie I've ever seen uh, or that I should say that I've seen this year. It is the movie that is most relentless in its bid to simply refuse to give any kind of pleasure or enjoyment to its audience. In fact, it hates them. Uh, Well, guess what? The critics and the audience in this case hate you back. This movie has uh, the worst cinema score, which is a sort of um, an industry guide uh, is a survey of uh, of viewers uh, for movies. The the worst cinema score of any superhero movie ever, I believe. (laughs) Uh, So good job, guys. You hate your audience and your audience even worse than Black Adam. I believe so. Yes. Um, I believe this is the first major superhero movie to be ranked like a D or a D (laughs) minus. I got to admit that half of that description made me go, huh? 
Okay. That sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Catherine, what- It sounds interesting. It's not. It is a slog. It is just joyless and miserable. Catherine, what did you not consume? I uh, <laughs> read a bunch of lady novels this last couple of weeks and can't even talk about them on this podcast because I know who our listeners are and y'all don't care. And also they weren't really good enough to talk about. So instead, I'm going to talk about something that has brought me a lot of joy and happiness that is the opposite of a musical miserable slug. And that is Eric Bames podcast for reason why we can't have nice things. It's so good, y'all. This podcast is just a delight. Uh, this is the second season, and um, it's full of terrible news. Uh, so in that sense, it is not fun. But um, last week's episode was just about why I cannot Zoom with a doctor in another state and get my health care provided. And that is a question that we have all wondered and we have all raged at. And uh, Eric has some answers for us and also some lawsuits that might fix that. But my favorite episode of the ones that have been released so far is uh, the case of the 17,000 missing kidneys. Nick, I know that you're disappointed that it was not called the curious case of yeah. the 17,000. <laughs> the strange case. The strange case. Of Dr. Liver. Of Dr. Liver yeah. and the missing kidneys. Um, I follow the uh, organ donation, organ sales uh, discourse fairly closely, and there was still uh, a lot for me to learn and be outraged about in this episode, especially about the regional monopolies in um, organ donor matching, which are um, just utterly unconscionable, just really very upsetting. So uh, if you have not had a chance to listen to this limited series podcast yet, I strongly recommend that you do. It's Eric Bames, Why We Can't Have Nice Things. Uh, yeah, the organ uh, thing, like there are stories he tells of where people leave like igloo coolers with kidneys at the airport. Just like, like they go through oops. security and then they forget to go to the luggage pickup or something. It's really, it's. I mean, it's. It would be funny if it weren't yeah. a actual life and death. Uh, so I went to finally after a decade of hearing about it and being up and around the region with some frequency. I finally visited the Storm King Art Center up in upstate New York on the left side of the Hudson River, about a, uh, an hour north of. Uh, New York City. Um, it's 500 acres of gigantor sculptures. It's mostly like manicured, semi-manicured wildlife and lawns and trees and, and little brooks and pathways and walk around. And then a five trillion ton Richard Serra piece of iron, um, Alexander Calder, Maya Lin, uh, other people. It's your eyes can't really truly uh, fathom it. It is so cool. Um, go there, bring a picnic basket uh, with Boo Boo Bear uh, and uh, just stroll around. It's particularly nice right now um, because it's the fall and there's lots of foliage things happening and it's not yet too cold to enjoy it. You will feel like you are in a Pink Floyd video that doesn't exist. Uh, just huge iron work, man-made things uh, against this backdrop uh, really uh, just kind of like stuns you into slow silence. And I'm sure with repeat visits, all kinds of new things open up or don't, and just a nice place to walk and spend the day. Storm King Art Center, uh, can't go wrong. The people were right. Uh, I just didn't listen to them for a really long time. I'm here to say that you were right. Um, it's really cool to go to. Um, bring a kid and a blanket. Okay. Did you have a favorite piece, Matt Welch? Um, I would say uh, no, I, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, which one it exactly was. I don't think it was a Richard Sarah, but it might've been. Um, so I wasn't really, I wasn't focused on the individual artist, Nick. It was more about the, the uh, largeness of things, but it's a kind of a, a gigantic iron looks like the kind of letter a, but with some stuff on it, uh, look on my Instagram, you can see a picture of my daughter uh, standing uh, in front of it. And it's ridiculous. Uh, and it's it's sort of perched at the top of a slow, uh, low uh, hill in the middle of a, a pretty cleared out field. And it's just, uh, you can't, you cannot process the information that your eyes are telling you. So that was probably my favorite. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. 
But anyways, uh, that's all the unsureness we have time for. You already heard about one podcast. The other good ones you can all find at reason.com slash podcasts. Speaking of which, uh, Nick, are there any events in New York City you care to popularize here at the end of hours? Yeah, sure. There's the Soho Forum on October 21st with uh, David Leonhardt and John Early talking about the American dream. Uh, there's a Reason Speakeasy, which is a live taping of my interview podcast with Musa Al Garbi on October 24th. And there may or may not be any tickets left to the Reason Roundtable live taping at the uh, Comedy Cellars Village Underground on November 4th. If we're sold out, I think there's a wait list. And, you know, sometimes because of satanic spells, people get sick or can't make it. So maybe the wait list will open up if, in fact, all tickets are sold. Uh, but those are all coming up. You can find that at reason.com slash events. And if you're waitlisted and somehow get bounced, you're right next to all the comedy. So just go to one of the comedies um, uh, clubs right around there. It's a great part of uh, New York City. A fun time uh, will be had by all. Um, all right. Thank you for listening. Uh, catch us next week here in the same uh, bat channel or joker channel or whatever. And, uh, and goodbye. Yourself.